and listeners to the health revolution the program that shows you how to have a life of vibrant well-being in a world full of noisy health trends we bring you clarity in a sea of fads we reveal the science-backed strategies that truly work we explore physical strength emotional resilience and mental mastery these are the keys to an enriched life Join us for inspiring interviews with champions who conquered life's health challenges fueling your journey. Are you ready to unlock your potential to live with vitality and purpose? Then join the health revolution. I'm your host, Adriana Morrison, health and fitness expert, speaker, and a mom who understands. Let's embark on this transformative quest. Together, we're about to change the game starting now. The information provided in this show is intended for educational and entertainment purposes only. Viewers should use their own discretion and consult with a healthcare professional for personalized guidance and recommendations. The opinions and views expressed by the guest in this episode are solely their own and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of their employer or any affiliated organizations. Welcome, everybody, to the Health Revolution. I'm your host, Adriana Morrison, and I am super excited that you are tuning in today. Of course, don't forget to hit the subscribe button, no matter which way you are tuning in. And of course, all things when it comes to health and wellness, the physical strength, the emotional resilience, and the mental mastery. Today, we're diving into the physical piece, as in our heart health and why the our cardiology health means so much more than we truly recognize for it to be. We know that heart disease, hypertension, that these are some of the more concerning societal conditions that we are facing today. And so it's time to really dive into how we can address these so that we can optimize our health for the for the better. My guest today is someone who is extremely expert in all of this. I'm excited to introduce you to her. First, take a look at this. Introducing Dr. Trinice Goodlow, professionally known as Dr. G, a trailblazer in the world of cardiology and nursing education. As an education consultant, cardiology nurse, practitioner, medical science liaison, and the visionary founder of Dr. G, the MP, LLC, she's on a mission to demystify cardiology concepts for nurses and nurse practitioners. With her motto, Cardiology Concepts Simplified, Dr. G empowers healthcare professionals to stay at the forefront of heart health. She champions the importance of annual EKGs and advocates for patients to proactively manage their cardiology care. Her educational approach ensures that complex topics are made accessible, fostering a deeper understanding and confidence among healthcare providers. Dr. G's journey in healthcare is as dynamic as her personality. From being an avid basketball player to her discipline as an amateur powerlifter, she brings strength, determination, and passion to everything she does. Her academic achievements include a Bachelor of Science in Nursing and a Doctor of Nursing Practice degree, with her research earning accolades for its focus on vulnerable populations. In her roles as a nurse educator, provider, and adjunct professor, Dr. G has been a beacon of knowledge, sharing her expertise in cardiology, EKG interpretation, and evidence-based practice. Now, as a medical science liaison, she continues to shape the future of healthcare by presenting cutting-edge research and collaborating with hospital systems to enhance patient outcomes. Dr. G, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing quite well, Adriana. I have to say thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm very excited to be here, so thank you. 
I I love the fact that you bring the receipts and let's dive into it. Talk to, talk to us about why cardiology matters and what is it that we, where is it that we are struggling as a society to understand the seriousness behind what we're looking at in our heart health? Certainly. So unfortunately, the number one killer in the country is heart disease. And also, unfortunately, a lot of the ailments that are cardiology ideology are actually asymptomatic. Um, a lot of people don't realize they may have hypertension. A lot of people don't know they may have high cholesterol. Um, and unfortunately, being reactive just makes it more difficult to treat. So I make it my business to educate patients to understand that we need to be having a proactive approach. That way you can live a long, healthy uh, life and have a great quality of life as well. What brought you to this part, part in your life where when you, as you were going through school and you decided that this was going to be where you wanted to go, how did you get from there to here? Oh, wow. Uh, that is a great question. Um, and it has been a very long journey. Uh, when I was very uh, new in my career and I was a floor nurse uh, working on telemetry units, I found myself gravitating more towards the patients who had underlying cardiac uh, issues going on. So much as so I would get on the whiteboard and I would start drawing anatomy and explaining this is what's happening with your heart and this is why you're on these medicines and so on and so forth. And so it just kind of evolved over time, uh, becoming an educator first with patients and then with my peers. Um, and then later on, I decided to go back to school to further my education to get more information um, on the topic. And I was fortunate enough to do my doctoral dissertation in hypertension management, specifically in the uh, African-American population. Um, so after that, uh, I started practicing as a cardiology nurse practitioner. Um, and that was great because I was able to really have my thumbprint in the pulse and get that individualized patient care and meet them where they were, where they were and learn about them and how I can suit their lives. Because compliance is a very, very important piece, but I want to fit their life. They don't need to fit necessarily what I'm saying. So I want to work with them. And that was a great journey. And currently now I'm working as a medical science liaison. So I have the pleasure of impacting research now um, in healthcare professionals. Um, and so it's just been a great journey and I'm honored and privileged to just do what I do. So speaking of journey, what portion of your personal journey was part of your decision to really delve into cardiology health? Well, I think some of it is just being a former athlete or I should say current athlete since I actually had my last, uh, my first powerlifting meet this past weekend. So it was quite yes. an experience. So, um, but just understanding the correlation between um, uh, what a person expects, what is quote unquote normal, right? And that is shaped by our experiences. So I think about even my own children, the, the uh, example I'm giving them on what's normal. So mom is going to the gym. My middle son, oh, mama, where are you going? Are you going to the gym now? I want them to, to see that. So for them, exercise is normal. My husband and I make sure we emulate good eating habits as well um, because it's that foundational piece. Now, having said that, if there's an individual that comes from an environment or a family where that wasn't quote unquote normal and they had to learn these behaviors, it might be more challenging, but with the correct mindset, you're able to achieve any and everything. Um, and again, it's an honor to be on the journey with patients when they are making these decisions that way I can at least guide them in the correct fashion. What did you what do you notice in trends when it comes to different diverse backgrounds? You mentioned in the African American community that this hypertension and just the concerns that are that are that are part of the population. Are there tr trends that have come up for you that have surprised you or are there certain trends that we're not aware of when it comes to heart disease and hypertension that we need to put more focus on? I wouldn't necessarily say I, anything particularly surprised me, but just to give you a couple, a little background information, um, unfortunately in this country, minorities are at a higher risk. Any minority, whether you're African American, Hispanic, Asian, what have you, um, background, you're at a higher risk to have um, these kind of health problems compared to the Caucasian population. Um, so that's one thing that kind of piqued my interest is how can we get health equity, right? Because we, we really and truly want equity for everybody to have the right opportunities to be able to live a long, healthy and full life. Um, so that's something that I'm very passionate about. Um, and unfortunately, 
Um, there's higher risk of stroke in African American population, higher risk of um, amputations in African Americans, Hispanics, and whatnot. So asking myself, what can I personally do to keep these families whole and intact and make sure that patients are having that great quality of life and they look good, they feel good, they're motivated, they want to live life. So um, we have such a gift to be here and I want people feeling the best when they're here. So how much of it is genetics and how much of it is environmental? You know, that's a great question. Um, we call environmental things um, modifiable risk factors, things that you have control over. So you have control over the amount of exercise you do, the type of foods you eat, if you smoke, if you drink, if you're getting good sleep. Um, those are all modifiable. Non-modifiable would be something like you cannot help your gender, you cannot help your age, you cannot help your health history. Um, so those are the things that are very challenging to overcome. Now, having said that, you may have a poor family history that doesn't automatically mean that you're going to have a negative outcome, but you will have to work harder to make sure that you're not another statistic. And when you have conversations with patients, are, do you, are you finding that more people are leaning into some of the input that you're sharing with them? Is it, does it depend on their, their health status or the seriousness behind the diagnosis that they're, that they're, potentially facing. What are you noticing about the the leaning in that's that's happening these days? You know, that's a great question. So when I was in patient care, my approach was very much I let the patient lead, lead. So for example, if I had a patient, let's say they had high blood pressure and, you know, to manage high blood pressure, there's a couple things you need to do. Um, diet, exercise, smoking, alcohol, sleeping, dental care. So that's that's literally six things I just listed. So I would explain to them, you know, your pressure is high. Well, what does that mean? Well, think about all of the pressure going boom, boom, boom. You don't want that on your brain, your heart, and your kidneys, right? We want a nice little tap, right? Because it preserves the organ. So doing visual things like that, it's like, oh, okay, I see you don't want that big like boom, boom, boom happening. Okay, so so now what can I do to help that? So I would list maybe those six things and you know, I'd ask them straight up, what's easiest for you? What's the easiest thing? In an ideal world, yes, I'd like you to do all six. But someone may say to me, you know, I, I can't stop smoking right now. It's, I have some things going on. But, you know, I probably could cut back on the fast food. And I, I would take it. Because a patient will be more compliant with what they pick rather than what I pick. So my job is to support them in that journey and be a consultant and say they're eating great. And I'll say, you know, you did an excellent job. I'm very proud of you. So tell me, what's the next thing you want to work on? And kind of have that approach. I always had an 80-20 rule with that. 80% of the time, eating, exercise, all of that stuff. 20% of the time, enjoy your life. Unfortunately, out of all of the risk factors I listed, smoking is the really the only one where it's a hard and fast no. Um, there's no 80-20 with smoking. It's either you're, you're smoking or you're not. So, And I would say that would probably be the most important one out of all of them. Um, but again, I would let the patient lead because you get more compliance and they're more active in their care. So I'm, I'm curious about this one. So obviously there's more, there has been more awareness about smoking. Does it matter the type of smoking? because there's variations. You have cigarette smoking, you have cigars, and then you have other components out there. Uh, or how do you view all of that? Does that impact the severity of hypertension or heart disease for what you've seen for trends? Well, I will say this. Um, unfortunately, you don't know how you're going to react to something until you do it. Right? We've all heard one-off stories of someone who smoked for 50 years and never got cancer, right? But that's that's going to be the exception and not the rule. So for the vast majority of us, smoking, any sort of smoking is just a hard, fast no. Smoking creates constriction in the blood vessels. So if I already have high pressure, why would I want my blood vessels getting even tighter? That's making the pressure go up even more. Not only that, with smoking, it hardens them too. So I'm not pliable anymore. I'm hard and I'm tight and I have pressure built up, that damages things. So again, I try to give those visuals and to explain my position um, and not be the sort of provider, oh, don't smoke because I said so. Well, 
I mean, that doesn't really work too well. It doesn't work well with kids, right? Don't do it because I didn't say so. Like, this is why we're doing what we're doing. So. So in the case of like, say, cannabis or vaping, for example, it, would those fall under those same categories of, of that would fall under the same concerns that you have just for the as different scenarios that would be in? As far as cannabis, um, that I am not sure the answer to that question. There's actually some varying um, research on cannabis falling into that. Now, as far as vaping, um, the FDA actually came out with a, a vaping apparatus to help with smoking cessation. But for those people that are not smokers, you certainly shouldn't start vaping. Not only that, a lot of the vapors have nicotine in them as well. So nicotine is addictive and can do some of the same qualities. So the kind of hard and fast rule is stay away. Your lungs shouldn't be getting smoke. Your lungs like air, not smoke. So stay away from it. Now, what about the case of secondhand smoke? Say there's an environment where somebody's working or I'm trying to think of different scenarios that might come up that maybe they're limited with their job responsibilities and they're being exposed. Um, you know, I, I remember my grandfather, he had passed away years and years ago of emphysema. He used to play, he used to play with uh, bands and so, but he never was a smoker, but he, but he played in different mm -hmm. clubs. What, what is the, what is the rule of thumb or what are some parameters that you like to be, to put into place if someone is, if they're forced to be in an environment where there is secondhand smoke? Well, first and foremost, um, condolences to your grandfather, because um, having a grandparent is a very special relationship. So, like I said, uh, condolences for that. Um, but to answer your question, secondhand smoke is very, very dangerous. It's very, very dangerous. Um, there are several cases of patients um, getting cancer, having cardiovascular problems, strokes, heart attacks, what have you, just because their spouse, they lived with a smoker. Um, so secondhand smoke does not exempt you from anything that I've said from this point up to this point. Um, as far as strategies and, and how to do that, really and truly the best strategy is to try to get that person to stop smoking because not only are they hurting you, they're hurting themselves too. Um, another thing that I don't think is really talked about with secondhand smoke is really the health costs associated with it, right? And I'm not talking about, oh, buying cigarettes, which cigarettes are expensive, they are. But even the cigarette itself, you're gonna be seeing a provider more often. You're more likely to need medical visits and medication. And so that costs money, you know? So we have to look at the socioeconomic ramifications as well, in addition to just feeling poorly and being in that environment. So I would encourage that person to try to help that person not smoke and, and do that. Um, if all else fails, you just have to ask them to only smoke outside. Don't bring it in the house. I mean, there's other, you know, other things. Don't smoke in the car with me. Don't smoke in the car at all. Just, you know, see if they're willing to just remove themselves. So what majority is smoke free because that secondhand smoke gets in curtains and couches and chairs and, you know, the smoke settles in it. Right. Um, and so you don't want to have that sort of environment. And so, I, and of, I, of course, I think of those who who do have the, the case of one person is a smoker and then one person isn't. So then have you helped to mitigate in the past? Before we go to break, just want to ask you real quickly, have you helped to mitigate conversations in which maybe a concerned spouse uh, in a relationship where one where the other one is smoking? Have you had to explain carefully? Have you found yourself where your input matters in letting letting it be known what the potential dangers are? Uh, absolutely. And in my experience, what I found with most smokers is they're willing to, they're very amendable to smoking with restriction. So um, I've had experiences where people will tell me, I'm not, I'm never going to stop smoking. I don't care what you say, but I'm not also trying to hurt anybody else. So then they will put those boundaries in place. Okay. I'll only do it outside or, you know, that sort of thing. So yes, I have had success with that, thankfully. And I can't wait for us to dive into the EKGs and how we can go ahead and, and get a greater hand on our heart health. First, we're going to take a commercial break and we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere.
We will be right back after this. Hello, Heart Warriors. Welcome back to Fit Bites with Adriana. Today we're zeroing in on a vital topic, and that's heart health. So let's explore some fresh tips to keep our hearts beating strong. First, let's talk movement. Instead of just focusing on traditional cardio and lifting weights, mix it up with activities like dancing, hiking, or even playing a sport. These fun alternatives keep your heart pumping and your workouts exciting. Next up, stress management. Did you know that laughter is great for your heart? It reduces stress hormones and promotes relaxation. So make time for humor, watch a comedy, share jokes, or just be silly. Now, sleep is another heart hero. Aim for a consistent sleep schedule and create a relaxation bedtime routine. A well-rested heart is a happy heart. Now, hydration. Beyond just drinking water, try infusing your water with natural flavors like cucumber or mint. It's refreshing and it keeps your blood pressure in check. Now, finally, connection. Socializing isn't just good for your soul, it's good for your heart too. Regular interactions with friends and family can lower your risk of heart disease. So let's embrace these heart healthy habits with joy and enthusiasm. Stay tuned for more Fit Bites and here's to a vibrant, healthy heart. Welcome to E360 TV, the live streaming and on-demand destination for influential voices and enlightened audiences. We offer trending, grassroots and purpose-driven content across a diverse range of interests. E360 TV is more than just watching programs. We offer the ability to interact with live shows connecting audiences to real, authentic influencers and storytellers while streaming to millions of devices. Real experiences. Raw conversations. One destination for it all. E360 TV. Welcome back to the Health Revolution. Welcome back, everybody. My guest today, Dr. G. We are talking all things cardiology, concepts simplified, and how to really embrace having a heart healthy life. And Dr. G, before the break, we were talking about different trends and things to be things to be on the lookout for that do impact our lives, things such as uh, smoking, exposure to smoke, how that has played a role. Now I'd like to dive into a little bit about how, what's your approach to talking to patients about having that heart healthy life, the role of the EQ and your just how you dive into all of this. So what are, starting off, what are some of the what are some of the misconceptions you have come across in your line of work when it comes to having a healthy heart or heart healthy life? Um, I would say the biggest misconception that I've heard from patients is if I feel okay, I am okay. Um, unfortunately, hypertension is actually known as the silent killer. Um, and again, you're not going to be able to feel your cholesterol be elevated. And unfortunately, that 
those two things in and of themselves are a recipe for strokes and heart attacks and negative outcomes and whatnot. Um, so that's what I would say is the biggest biggest misconception. If I if I don't feel it, everything's okay. And does it help for you to explain? And do, I know you mentioned before the break that uh, when you've taken a diagram of of the heart, or when you've explained and drawn out in detail that that patient connections in the mind of what's happening in their bodies really comes to fruition. That it 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 starts to click. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of my favorite things is to explain when I had the honor and privilege of caring for patients with heart failure, um, explaining that the left bottom chamber of the heart, that's the workhorse. So with heart failure, that left bottom chamber either has a problem of getting enough oomph, enough pump, or it has a problem with being able to relax enough so that the blood can refill and then go out to the body. Or there even have people that have um, both that problem, a weak pump and can't relax at the same time. But nevertheless, it all falls under the umbrella of heart failure. Let's see if we can bring up the slide of the heart anatomy. I want to just see if we can just dive into just the general mechanisms of the heart. If you wouldn't mind just taking us through how how our heart works and what can we expect of our heart as we are just breathing and just existing in life. Sure, absolutely. So on the diagram, you'll notice there's really two uh, predominant colors, blue and red. And so the blue is to represent blood that does not have oxygen. And the red is to represent blood that does have oxygen. So you have something called your superior and inferior vena cava. That is how blood enters through the top chambers of your heart. Um, the top chambers of your heart are your atria. So specifically the right atria, it goes through there, no oxygenated blood, and then it subsequently goes down to the right ventricle. So in the right ventricle, it still doesn't have blood and it ends up going out to the pulmonary artery into the lungs. So that's where blood actually gets oxygenated. And so the blood comes back into the pulmonary veins and enters the left atria down to the left ventricle and that left ventricle subsequently goes through the aorta and the aorta takes the blood throughout the entire body. And then the, the cycle repeats itself going through the inferior and superior vena cava and what have, what have you. And so you were saying, so the, the, when in the case of the hypertension, um, just connecting that with the diagram, you're saying that the ventricle is, is where we don't have enough oomph when um, in, in the mechanisms that we're not we're not getting enough in, in that particular scenario. In that scenario, that would be heart failure. Um, okay. If that left bottom chamber, um, abbreviated LV in this chart here, but that's your left ventricle. That's the workhorse of the heart. That's responsible for getting all the oxygen oxygenated blood to your entire body from head to toe. So if that chamber is weak, you can see how blood could get backed up. One of the, one of the signs and symptoms that someone could have with heart failure is if they have problems with breathing, which if you're having fluid going back into the lungs, that makes sense how you would have a problem breathing. How early can that scenario be? I'm thinking of, of the different type of, of viewers that could be watching. Uh, when something like this is first noticeable, is that an early stage or is that just a uh, obviously urgent care is needed at that point, but at the first sign of difficulty breathing, are there are there timelines that need to that someone needs to keep in mind when they notice that they're having they're having an issue? Um, to answer your question, yes. Um, the short answer is having difficulty breathing is not normal. Um, the problem with someone having difficulty breathing is there are a number of different disease processes that could be. It, it could be heart failure. It could be something called ischemia, meaning that the arteries on top of the heart aren't getting enough oxygen. It could actually mean they may have a pulmonary problem, such as emphysema or COPD. Um, so that's why one reason as a healthcare professional, we order a lot of diagnostic testing to figure out who is the culprit of this happening? So, you know, you may end up getting an ultrasound of your heart or a chest X-ray, even getting some blood work drawn. Um, we can actually get blood work drawn to see if you have too much fluid on board. 
And so that would lead us to say, oh, it, it probably is the heart in this case. Um, so again, like I said, the shortness of breath in and of itself is not completely diagnostic, but we look at the complete patient picture to say, oh, this is looking like this. And then we confirm with testing. One of the things that I love in my, I loved in my conversation with you prior to today is that you are, uh, you are ecstatic and you are excited about how important the EKG is. And uh, I wanted to dive into that. And if you can explain to our viewers the importance behind it, why we should have it, your protocol, and see if we could bring up the picture of the EKG as we, as we start diving into things. Yes, certainly. Um, so I enjoy EKGs for several reasons. Um, as far as my, my protocol that you alluded to a few moments ago, it is my personal belief that every patient should have an EKG at least annually. Um, my rationale for making that statement is heart disease is the number one killer in this country. And so when you get your annual visits, you should be getting your annual visits you need to have an EKG done. When in your life would you ever get an EKG done? And if you're getting referred to see a cardiologist or electrophysiologist or heart specialist, we need something to go off of. So it's very important to get what we call a baseline EKG. You want to know what the person's normal heart is doing. Um, ideally, yes, every year, I would say ask your primary care to get a, an EKG. But even if you got one every two to three years, that would still be helpful because, again, if something happens, okay, we have this reference point to say, oh, is this change new or is this always been there? Well, if you've never had an EKG, we're not necessarily sure. Um, so obviously you're going to get treatment and we're going to treat it as such that it's something new but it would be better to have some history along the way because it makes pinpointing problems a lot easier. Now, what does an EKG actually do for those who don't, who don't know or who just have heard of it before but just don't understand what it does? So EKG is an abbreviation for electrocardiogram. And so it's basically tracing the electrical pathway through the heart. And so on this uh, image here, you see there's a lot of letters. <laughs> Um, and those letters actually represent different phases of the heart cycle. Um, you notice you have, you'll see a P, a Q or S, you have uh, and a T. Those are really the main letters. The P represents really the top, the top two chambers, which are called the atria. Um, and we call that atrial depolarization. And that just means electricity going through the atria. Your QRS complex that represents ventricular depolarization. So that's a fancy word for just saying electricity going through the bottom chambers of the heart. When you get into the ST and T wave, that's looking at ventricular repolarization. And as I tell my students, that means you're getting re-energized and you're resting to get reinvigorated to do the whole heart cycle all over again. And you know, I've noticed I, I love my doctor, but she has never she has yet to approach me about having an EKG. And I don't ever recall it being a protocol such as, you know, say mammograms or colonoscopies or things like that. So what's been the dialogue amongst the medical community and why are why have we not heard more about this being an annual uh, practice to be mindful of? I would say two points to that. Um, first, unfortunately, we live in a society where everything is based on financials, um, reimbursement, Medicare, Medicaid, PPOs, you know, the whole deal. That's very heavily in our society. Um, and so I think that's one reason, because we all know insurances may or may not want to cover testing. Now, to your point, an EKG is a lot cheaper than a colonoscopy. I'll just say that. Um, do I know the exact price of an EKG? Currently in market, no, but I know when I was in school <laughs> over a decade ago, um, EKGs ran about $25, $35. Um, so they're probably upwards, even if it doubled, even if it was $100, you know, I still feel like that's a reasonable ask because you're able to prevent something. If we get an EKG and we see that the electrical pathway is abnormal, 
the person may need further testing. And now we're talking about preventing a heart attack. And that is very serious. Um, or we're discovering that a person has something called ischemia. Ischemia means not enough blood flow getting to an area of the heart. And unfortunately, ischemia can advance so much so that if arteries are getting clogged off in conjunction with cholesterol that I had mentioned earlier, but in conjunction with that, someone may need very serious heart surgery, open heart surgery. Um, so I just think about the prevention, even if the EKG cost $100, that's worth it if we're catching it and we may be able to deal with it versus an emergency happening and having emergency surgery. And that's way more expensive. So that's why I'm not quite sure. I don't understand why it's not included in preventative care. Because I know that in conversations with with medical providers, it's just, I, I don't ever recall on a personal note that it's been brought up. And I don't know if it's maybe because the assumption is, well, I tend to be one that's uh, that tries to be physically active. And so then say, maybe my doctor has not brought it up, but I've never recalled it coming up as in, as an annual, as an annual test to be on the lookout for. So, mm -hmm. and I, I, do you find that the language is starting to change? And I, I know that you're championing, you're championing the cause of making this routine. Are you noticing a trend in the medical community or is it, are there still more dialogues to be had? There's more dialogues in, to be had. And so what I've found throughout my years um, in clinical practices in the cardiology umbrella, it's automatic. You walk in our door, you're going to get an EKG. However, cardiology is a special specialty. What I'm finding is in the primary care world, that's not necessarily a thing. And it really depends on the individual healthcare provider if they're going to get an annual EKG or not. I'll use myself as an example. I was seeing one provider, he made sure I had an EKG every year. Um, I had to leave that provider and get another one. And this latest one I had, she doesn't get them at all. And so I questioned her about that. And she mentioned the money about it not being covered by insurance. And I said, well, that's fine. I'll pay for it myself. And so now she knows she's going to get an EKG on me. Have you noticed the trends with heart related situations, heart hypertension uh, in if it runs in a particular patient's family? Have you noticed that the ratios look a certain way? Does the hypertension and the heart conditions that you've seen, does it not matter? Or uh, are there specific trends that are associated with, with genetics, for example? So um, one of the cardiologists I worked with had a saying, he, he used to say, say that genetics loads the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. Um, and I think that's a very fitting analogy, right? Um, just because everybody in your family has hypertension, that doesn't necessarily mean you will, but it certainly puts you at a predisposed risk of having it. So hypertension, and I'm happy you asked me this question, hypertension particularly is one of those disease processes that we have control. Um, if somebody came to me, if I had a patient, if I had patients come to me before, well, everybody in my family has hypertension. Okay, well, tell me more about your family. What are they eating? Are they active? Do they smoke? Do they drink? Because if you say yes, 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 well, that sounds like to me that they have modifiable risk factors. And if they were to work on that, they may not have hypertension. Um, so that's what I mean about people kind of meeting me in the middle. Having said that, it's very, very important to not ignore this. Um, hypertension is a very, very serious thing. Half of adults have hypertension um, and you don't necessarily feel it. And so I want to get the word out that is very important. We have to have low salt, salt diets. The American Heart Association recommends that you get 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise per week. That patient say, well, okay, what does that mean? Well, moderate exercise according to the American Heart Association would be something like walking 2.5 miles per hour or gardening is, are good examples. And vigorous would be if you were doing um, HIIT training, high intensity interval training or, or running or hiking up a hill would be examples of, of that. So just working on your sleep. A lot of people forget about the sleep piece, right? You have to get your rest. Um, the alcohol piece, 
Um, the American Heart Association says that women shouldn't have more than one alcoholic beverage per day and men shouldn't have more than two. And patients ask me, well, what is an alcoholic beverage? That's a great question. That's either one beer, five ounces of wine, or one and a half ounces of hard alcohol. I like to be very specific because a drink to you may be different than what a drink to me is. So being very specific in recommendations and what we tell patients so they have concrete instructions to say, okay, I can police myself to say, you know, I only can have one beer tonight. I'm going out, but I only can have one beer tonight. I love these examples. We're going to take a commercial break. We will be right back. Stick with us. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back after this. Thank you so much for watching The Health Revolution. Our show is growing and it's all thanks to viewers like you. No matter how you found us, please hit the subscribe button so we can stay connected and continue to deliver amazing content to you. Life is so fragile and we're constantly reminded just how fragile life can be, especially when we or a loved one is told we have cancer. Cancer survivor myself, I can tell you, we still feel very alone in this journey. There's a study that's been shown that patients who are socially isolated have a worse prognosis, have a worse outcome than patients who are socially interconnected. Buddies for Life is a non-profit cancer support group for those whose life has been impacted by cancer. Humor, hope, heart, and hugs. Humor, hope, heart, hugs, and a whole lot of love. Share this with your friends and family and support this community in every way you can. No one should face cancer alone. I am a chemo buddy for life. We are a buddies network. No one does cancer alone. Be a buddy. And we are all here for you as a community of love. We are chemo buddies for life. And if you've heard three words, you have cancer, for yourself or someone else, you belong with us at chemo buddies for life. Healing through connections. And now we want to give special thanks to Biomed Mobile IV for sponsoring the health revolution. Biomed Mobile IV is Colorado's top mobile IV therapy service servicing throughout the state of Colorado. They offer an array of vitamins and above and beyond safety preparation. Biomed Mobile IV, your dedication to health and wellness is exactly what our show is all about. And we thank you for your support. Welcome back to the Health Revolution. Welcome back, everybody. My guest today, Dr. G, we are talking about cardiology, com cardiology concepts simplified and all things having that healthy heart and healthy life. So Dr. G, we, before the break, we were talking about uh, different, we we're talking about things to keep in mind, parameters to keep in place. One of the things that I'm curious about are, what are what would you say it would be examples of a good voice advocacy to for a patient to talk to their doctor about EKGs and exploring maybe any concerns that they have trying to be proactive what would be what would be some really good examples of how to approach it so that so that they could initiate the conversation with their doctors that's a very great question and very insightful. Um, I would say some of the things we were talking about early in our conversation, I think a great icebreaker is, you know, um, hi, Dr. So-and-so. Um, I'm aware that half of people have heart disease. That worries me. That sounds like I have a 50% chance. Um, can you talk to me about my risk? Um, what can we do about this to be proactive? Is there anything that I can do? Um, can we talk about my family? Um, I would also say even before having that conversation, know your family history, because that's going to help that provider say, well, you will maybe at a higher risk because so-and-so had this, this and that, you know, or say, oh, no, you're not as high of a risk, but we're all at an increased risk as we age. So, yes, we, we should start looking at this stuff. So that, I think that's just a great icebreaker. So one 
you know, it's circling around to some of the, the different hats you wear, being adjunct professor and in terms of teaching, I'm curious, how has your experience being an adjunct professor has impacted your, your teaching, how you approach uh, nurses, those within the field and, and those who you're guiding? Um, my students, um, fantastic. I, I, I can't rave more about them. Um, my students were my inspiration for even starting Dr. GDMP. Um, I saw there was a need within my community. Um, EKG interpretation can be an uncomfortable topic and not all universities cover that topic. Um, I was fortunate to attend a school that had a whole electrophysiology course, so I was able to get that material. Um, but not not everyone does. So when I saw that, I started to do it at the university and I tried to contact the dean at the university. Unfortunately, they didn't return any of my communication. So I said, well, I'll just do this on my own. I, I, just because you have an obstacle doesn't mean you can't overcome that obstacle. So my goal is for every single healthcare provider to be comfortable and competent when getting an EKG. The expectation is not to be able to read an EKG like a cardiologist or an electrophysiologist or an advanced practice provider who's in that space who does EP and cardiology. But you should be able to get the EKG, read it, know a variant of normal versus, oh, this is something that's happening and then write the proper referral for it. So you're spearheading this, that this is your, this is where you're trailblazing and you're making the connection within the medical field that, that this is something that needs to be more of a, a priority in the forefront. So to, to further help patients, I'm going to see if we can bring up your, um, the info on your slide, Dr. G, the NP, talk a little bit about the breakdown of how, uh, what this looks like for those that you, that you work with those who are, uh, who are curious about doing something like this. Can you say a little bit more about uh, the onboarding process, what all this looks like? Certainly, so um, my team and I have created something called the EKG Clarity Compass. And so the whole purpose is to build comfort and confidence with EKG interpretation for nurses and nurse practitioners. Although I have had a couple physicians take my courses as well. I welcome all, but I was just really targeting nurse practitioners because I am a nurse practitioner. Um, but having said that, the point of this content uh, currently is five courses. We're working on a sixth course is to be able to have a foundation where I show you where to look, when to look and what to look for. Coupled with I teach using stories. I teach using um, analogies and whatnot. I, I have some funny stories about going to see fireworks with your family or how it's ladies first or how, you know, the proper way to bake cookies. So all of these create connections with, within, the, within the brain. So these associations stick. So you understand these stories in EKG telling. And what's the onboarding process looking like? Is, is this an ongoing course or ongoing program that you have? Are there different points throughout the calendar year where this is made available? So we actually, um, this is going on ongoing, um, and we have several things we offer our clientele. Not only do we give them the opportunity to take the courses that are all done 100% by me, um, we also meet twice a month and do a live chat. I do a live teaching. I also do one-on-one um, -on -one sessions with everybody that is um, within the EKG Clarity Compass. I also break down their EKGs. Um, I really want to be there active with my clients. Um, I just have to say it has been such an honor and a privilege to serve my community. I am elated on doing this. We're about to hit year three um, and I want to keep doing this. So I'm just very grateful for people embracing me. And I'm just so proud of the work that we're doing. Real quickly, before we take our next commercial break, what is your favorite success story out of someone taking your course and the impact they've made in their communities? I had the pleasure of working with a pre-op nurse practitioner and a medical director said an EKG was fine, but she felt the patient had something called a bifascicular block. So she texted me the EKG and asked, hey, what do you think? I'm like, this guy definitely has a right bundle branch block and a left anterior fascicular block, which would be a bifascicular block. So she stopped him from having surgery, wrote a referral to cardiology. He ended up getting a stress test, which was positive for ischemia. And this gentleman actually ended up getting two stents in his chest. And as far as I'm concerned, she saved his life. 
Wow. That's fantastic. That's, that's incredible. We're going to take a quick commercial break. Don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back after this. Hi, this is Clara Capato, your host for Women Winning Their Way, where we talk about how you can create success all on your terms. Join us Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Limelight Network here on E360 TV. to the health revolution. Welcome back to the show. My guest today, Dr. G, we are talking all things cardiology, concept simplified, and having a heart healthy life. Dr. G, I'm curious, how do you balance your personal responsibilities? How do you maintain that personal balance and doing all the things that you do, including your powerlifting? Well, um, I would say that I do a very good job of compartmentalizing and I'm very locked in and whatever task I'm doing at that moment, I, I make sure I'm focused in. So that would be my secret, compartmentalizing. So just like when, you, when you're focused on one thing, you don't try to multitask in the middle of the... Yes, I'm right. hearing more and more how, how important that is. Got to embrace that a little bit more from my end. <laughs> and what would you what would you say to nurses who who are thinking about specializing in cardiology? What would you say to the aspiring nurse or or that nurse practitioner who's listening in right now? I would say absolutely go for it. Um, it's very important that whatever you pursue, you have to have an interest, you have to have a passion in. And one thing I used to tell my students all the time is get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, you can't grow, evolve, change if you're not willing to be uncomfortable because growing is uncomfortable. So show yourself some grace, um, be persistent, be focused. You're capable, you're very smart because you've made it that far. So intelligence is not in a question. Um, but just get comfortable with being uncomfortable and, and enjoy being a rookie because when you're experienced, then your expectations go up. So <laughs> very true. Where can viewers find you on the Internet and social media? Yeah, so I'm on Instagram. Uh, my handle is at Dr. G, the MP, uh, D-R-G-T-H-E-N-P. I'm also on Facebook um, at Dr. G, the MP as well. Same handle. Uh, and my website is uh, drgvnp.com. Now you're also on LinkedIn too. So we do have LinkedIn viewers that check out our show. And so uh, so obviously here's your handle on LinkedIn. And where are you uh, speaking or where are you planning on, what does 2024 look like for you in terms of speaking engagements and events that you have on the calendar? Uh, 2024 is very exciting. Um, Again, I'm elated to be here. I've been on several podcasts as well. Um, but one of the biggest events I'm going to be speaking at is this fall in October at the Midwestern Advanced Practice Registered Nurse Conference. That's going to be in mid-October, and I'll actually be doing three lectures, uh, two on EKGs and one on hypertension. That's very obviously that's level expert. So I'm excited for you. And I, I know that time flies and and we're out of time. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. G. I appreciate we appreciate your time and your energy and, and the, the enormous amount of knowledge you have in terms of heart health. Well, again, thank you for having me. It's been an honor and a privilege. Uh, and I hope we get to do it again someday as well. Oh, absolutely. We got to do it. Got to do it. <laughs> So for our viewers, of course, you know, our website is at www.thehealthrevolutiontv.com. You can subscribe to our newsletter. You can also email us for any, any show ideas that you might have that we can certainly over deliver on and covering those topics. Upper left-hand corners are QR code. You can grab that and get to our website quickly. And then, of course, we are on E360 TV, specifically the Achieve TV channel, 
on Tuesdays and Thursdays, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern on a weekly basis. That's all the time that we have. Until next time, take care of yourselves. We will see you soon.